Jones, whose daughter she is, but she isn't ours. For God's sake, take it back. You won't get Lucy. Lucy, are you all right? Yes, please come home, Daddy, please. No! The godsend. Mummy, don't let Daddy send me away. Welcome to That's Canon, Episode 8. The podcast where we talk about the Canon Film Library and other similar films. I'm Phil. And I'm Greg. Greg. I find it very odd that they didn't use the poster for the godsend on Amazon Prime. Have you seen the poster for this thing? Uh, you know, come to think of it, I probably saw it like at a glance when I Googled it, but I immediately went to the Amazon page and then missed it. Check your Discord. It is a really good poster. Oh, wow. It has an that upside really down good. cross. It has somebody's face. Creepy eyes. A gift from heaven. A curse from hell. It really sets the mood for the movie that you're watching. Because Amazon That's... Prime just has crappy letter art. Yeah, I, I did notice that. It was kind of like the default. Uh, hey, we don't have a poster on file, so you get text across a weird background. Exactly. <laughs> and it was, shame, yeah. it is really great great poster they should have used it the godsend is a film from 1980 directed by gabriel beaumont who has really made no other films that we would ever know unless you've seen shame unless you've seen Beastmaster 3 (laughs) uh that's hard that's gonna be a hard no for me i haven't seen a Beastmaster, let alone the third one (laughs) Uh, and it was direct Uh, er, (laughs) written by olaf pooley who, again, a lot of stuff, um, but nothing I think we would really know except Crucible of Horror. Really? Did, I th- wait, I think, did you mention this when we did the last episode that, yeah. they, were, that they shared a writer? Okay, yeah. Olaf that, that, that Pooley is Reed and also the writer of Crucible of Horror. Well so, done. So he's, it's, got some good, he's got some good work. Exactly. And it kind of, you know, I would say that you already see some similarities in Olaf's writing in that he writes about a family. Yeah, weird family then. Family kind of breaking apart and into internal family drama. Exactly. Except the godsend, I would say no one person in the family is bad. Right? I mean, some people are a little misguided, but there's no there's no villain in the main central um, organic family. No, it's, this it, is this was a nice kind of change of pace because I, I I've mentioned it so many times to this point, but in a lot of the movies we've watched so far, there's there's so few, if any, redeemable characters. Like they're they're all just kind of assholes. This was a refreshing change of pace for sure. Exactly. So you start the movie and in big, bright red. Finally, it says Canon Productions, and... which I think is the, maybe the second that we've seen in the beginning of a film. Exactly. Yeah. It was, it was nice. It was, it started off with the MGM lion roar, but as soon as the main film starts, Canon productions. Okay. You mentioned the MGM. I think we've, we've pretty firmly established at this point that MGM must own the Canon yeah. library at this point. Right. Okay. Uh, oh, Cause probably the, all of them. if not all of them, probably the best portions of Canon. Yeah. So the, the film opens and we're getting this beautiful aerial shot of a field and it goes on kind of long and eventually we see a family and they're walking through this beautiful open field. Yeah, just taking a stroll. And we realize we're in England because they all have British accents. <laughs> <laughs> if the pleasant countryside didn't give it away, the accents definitely did. Now, this family has quite a few kids. There's... Davy, Lucy, Sam, and a baby named Matthew. Matthew, that was the, yep. Now the kids are like, Daddy, let's go run. And the dad and the three kids go running across the field. They're all having fun. And one Mm -hmm. of the children goes, Daddy, where's Mommy at? And Alan, the father, looks out across the open field to a tree where he sees his wife and some really creepy blonde woman just standing right underneath the there creepy. talking. Just talking. But you don't get to see what they're talking about. You don't get to hear it. You just see Alan right. kind of going like, who the oh, hell's my... Yeah, who's my wife talking to right now? Where did she come from? Exactly. 
exactly that was that was almost my first thing is where did this woman come from because this is a big open field she and they would have passed her right passed they, they would have passed or her or seen her yeah she materialized out of thin air really weird dun, dun, dun. um and they kind of zoom in on her eyes and alan's eyes and you think that there's like a psychic connection going on yeah you definitely there's right away and i think there's like a music sting too where you kind of immediately get there's some kind of implied tension here or suspicion or like maybe they knew each other or something i wasn't sure at this point you know and i was uh i actually watched this with the subtitles on because of their accents i didn't know how thick it was going to get with different characters and stuff oh okay yeah kind of a precautionary thing exactly so there were musical cues and when the eye stuff happened it always said eerie music (laughs) so um okay yeah it's accurate so they're they're kind of looking at each other and then it cuts to them all in their house and alan goes who is she where did she come from how does she even know who we are (laughs) and his wife kate kind of brushes it off and goes oh it's a small village people talk they probably know us yeah, that was a weird, like all that whole thing between the wife and the husband. You'd think that those were questions that they would ask before they invite this lady into their house. Exactly. <laughs> it almost seems like there was no discussion. It was just the wife goes, we're going to let her come over. And then it just Neighborly. happened. Now, Alan, the father, he's very well put together, blonde hair, you know, looks like a normal guy you don't he is not definitely you don't see him as the villain right and alan is played by malcolm stoddard who beyond the godsend was in a lot of other things but nothing that i've seen you know what he he looked really familiar and it didn't click until later he looks like a 50 50 mix of ewan mcgregor and paul bettany you know what i can totally see that right I, can so I think totally he's got the smile that. of Ewan McGregor, the eyes of Paul Bettany, and the hair of, I don't know, Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone. Yeah, <laughs> I, can, I can totally see that. So there's Alan, and then there's Kate, who's played by Sid Heyman. This was her last film, The Godsend. Oh, interesting. Had she had a, like a TV or a movie career before she this? She did some TV, but no, she never really you know, made it big. It seemed like it seemed like this hmm. was kind of it for her when it comes to films. Okay. Um, and she has, you know, she's a brunette, very pretty. You know, she has that motherly look to her. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and they're talking about this woman that they have invited who doesn't get a name. She's actually credited as the stranger in the movie. Yeah, I, when I was, I was looking in the credits because I, I was thinking about halfway through, you know, who did we get a name for that, that woman in the beginning? But yeah, we, you're right. We don't, I thought that she may have, you know, she says very little in this whole opening scene where we see her, but yeah, I thought for maybe she had introduced herself, but no, yeah, we don't get a name at all. So you looked at the credits. Did you notice what her name was? Angela Pleasance. And do you know who she's the daughter of? Donald. Donald Pleasance. Donald. Yep. yep. Very interesting. I didn't, first off, I didn't even know that he had a daughter, let alone a daughter that acted. And she was really good in this too. Oh yeah. I mean, right off the bat, when you see her, like you said, in the field and they, they kind of like snap zoom onto her face and she's got this, this kind of piercing stare. And I don't, I mean, I think I'm sure it was all makeup, but they, the way that they made up her face, it's this kind of like, she's very pale. I think that they, they probably brushed in her eyebrows a little bit. So they blended with her skin tone. Yes. She just kind of has a really, I don't know, unnatural look about her and the way that they did her hair. She's, I mean, she's got this almost kind of like a hippie look to her. She has the way that she's dressed as well, but village of the damned hair. She has yes. this blonde hair. That's so blonde. It's almost verging on very white. blonde, very, st- very like very straight. And she just, yeah, she just doesn't look like she belongs there. Yeah. So Kate and Alan, they, they kind of give her something to drink and they're kind of talking. She's very monotone, no real emotion coming out of her. But they notice she's also pregnant. Very pregnant, yeah. Very pregnant. 
And as the night goes on, Alan's like, okay, well, we have to get you home. And she's like, oh, okay. And Alan and Kate, they go to like put the dishes away. And you get this really Mm -hmm. awkward scene of the stranger walking around their house, touching things. Right. She kind of been left alone for a minute or two. I think the mom went to go tuck in the kid and the dad went off to deal with the the dishes or something, put away the cups. And she eventually gets to the phone where she yanks the phone line out from the the wall. And then she goes to like a pillar and she starts caressing it as if she's never seen (laughs) wood before. Mm, I love this British cottage architecture. Really weird. So when Alan and Kate finally come back, they're like, okay, we're going to go ahead and drive you back into the village, um, you know, and then you can kind of walk home from there. As soon as the stranger crosses the threshold of the house out to outside, she starts having contractions. Right. I feel like we should mention at this point, you know, they, she says very little in the scene up to this point, you know, they're trying to have a conversation with her, but they notice that they comment on the fact that she's pregnant and she says cryptically, Oh, I've, Oh, I've got many children. That's but they, right. They yeah. try to ask her questions about it. And she's kind of cagey with the details. And I think, I think the mom asks, you know, how many, Oh, how many kids do you have? We've got four. And she, and I don't think she answers. Does she? No, she just says I've had many. Oh, so many. It was, you know, kind of weird and it starts setting that, that like creepiness. Um, Very unsettling. So as soon as she starts having contractions, Kate is like, oh, you need to call the, the paramedics. You need to call the ambulance to get it here. And Helen's like, the phone's dead. And then Kate goes, are you sure? As if, <laughs> as if that's a real question. I mean. I yeah. Did they not think to just check the wall outlet that was a i noticed that too i was like why wouldn't you just see if it's plugged in exactly <laughs> i think maybe in emergencies people don't realize that you should troubleshoot from the wall out when your phone doesn't work um, i guess yeah but kate goes alan you need to go into the uh into the village and get the doctor i'll go ahead and help out the stranger deliver her baby so alan runs out and kate goes to work i i almost thought that she was a doctor or a nurse yeah, she kind of snaps to action and seems to know exactly what she's doing, which is a little odd. Yeah, she's giving instructions on pushing, and then the kid pops out. She's cutting the umbilical no cord. She has a, I think, I think, like you get a quick shot of the baby with the with the cord still attached, and yeah. you see that she's like, she has it clipped. I mean, which is kind yeah, of like weirdly a, professional, a big important part because that's like the feeding tube to the child, and you have to you know, like put a bandaid or like a rubber band around that. So it, you know, that's an open hole to your child. (laughs) An open hole. I mean, for lack of a better term, it's, you know, I was there when my kid was born. As soon as I cut the umbilical cord, they took him away because they had to get that, you know, thing closed up and stuff. Closed off. Yeah. So not bad for not, not bad for a home delivery in this case. Exactly. It was, I mean, maybe that was intentional that they mounted it to be, you know, kind of eerily smooth because you don't really see, I mean, the, the mother, the, this creepy mother doesn't look terribly distressed or kind of, you know, any kind of emotion on her face at all. She's very kind of stoic. Exactly. The whole thing. Yeah. There's no real like labor pains or screaming mm-hmm. or anything like that. They're just. All happens very quick. Very yeah. smooth. A, a perfect delivery. Um, the doctor eventually arrives, Dr. Collins, and he kind of just says the same thing. Like, hey, you did a really great job. I'm not really needed here anymore. Yeah, I think he, yeah, he says just that, doesn't he? Yeah. Oh, well, I think I'm, I'm no longer needed here. You've uh, kind of done the hard part yourself. The, the stranger goes, can I have a cigarette? And the doctor's like, absolutely not. You know, you have a baby here and you need to rest. And the, the stranger and Alan again, share another glance at each other. Yep. Another really creepy glance and it fades to the next day. And Kate goes into the room and she just finds the baby there. The stranger has left. (gasps) Oh man. The baby's still there though. So she abandoned her child with these total strangers and Kate being the doting mom that she is while having a baby for her own, just starts breastfeeding this child and goes, well, I have two breasts 
that's why you know god made women with two breasts so he can feed two kids at the same time (laughs) that's why i got a spare yeah that was a weird a weird turn that you know she's the the mother has disappeared and she immediately starts breastfeeding the stranger's child i don't know maybe that's maybe that's a maternal thing that i just don't understand but it could be an odd thing to do for a stranger because i'm right there with you i think it's really odd that the instinct of mothering a strange child kicks in immediately and goes like, let me feed you like with my breast. (laughs) I'm assuming that there's probably no formula and stuff like that. They were doing it all natural and stuff, but it's definitely really odd that, that she would just start breastfeeding. Um, Just jumping right to it. Yeah. I mean, I guess, like you said, it's maybe a maternal instinct, but that we're, that we're missing is, is dudes, but yeah, I mean, at this point, you don't know. I mean, the, the mother has been gone for, I don't know, 20 minutes. I mean, they've just woken up. And so, I mean, she could be in the bathroom for all they know. Exactly. I mean, you don't see they're like checking the house. And this is what, one of the criticisms for the film is that Alan and Kate are very non-reactionary towards a lot of things. And this is this is just the beginning of it. They're just like, yeah. oh, the the woman's gone and she left her child. Okay. <laughs> like well i guess this is our life now there is no calling the the police or anything um so kate and alan go out through the day as if it's normal and then it cuts to the next morning and kate runs up to alan and goes i think our our baby son matthew's dead and alan picks up the child and yeah, yeah their that's... their son has died in the middle of the night it was kind of a weird, uh, kind of a weird twist all of a sudden. I mean, it kind of came out of nowhere, but I mean, yeah, the, the mother kind of comes in and she's like white as a ghost. Yeah. And it's like, oh, geez, this, this took a dark turn really fast. It, do- it did, right? Especially yeah. killing children in movies. It's definitely not something that you see on a, on a routine basis within horror films. It's usually no. really taboo to do. Yeah. It's, I mean, and thankfully they, it, it, it's tasteful. It, it feels like a weird thing to say about this kind of subject matter, but it's not gratuitous or, or violent no. in any way. It's, it's, it's done in a way where you immediately sympathize with the parents. Exactly. But they do zoom in on her name is Bonnie, the baby that they're adopting or have been abandoned. The, the child that's been abandoned to them is Bonnie. They do zoom in on the child and, even as a baby, the baby's given a creepy look. Um, yeah, yeah. And then the family goes to, it cuts to this sign where it says births and deaths. Yeah, a like hospital. a government office or something? Or yeah, maybe a hospital. Really weird. Um, never really seen anything like that. But I guess at the same time that they announced that Matthew is dead to their government, they have also adopted Bonnie. And everyone seems pretty hunky-dory. The kids are kind of joking around and running down the stairs. And Alan and Kate yeah. are holding Bonnie. And Kate even says, Bonnie's a godsend. Yeah, like, I think she says, yeah, you know, when she says, you know, she's a godsend, I mean, this, she makes me feel so much better. I mean, I guess it's understandable that you take comfort in the death of a child with by doting on your other children, I guess, I mean, it's not something I can say I've experienced, but yeah, they do, both of the parents and even the kids, like you said, seem, yeah, uh, weirdly unaffected by what's just happened. Kind of a horrific death of, oh, he, the, the other kid was maybe, Matthew was two, one? Uh, yeah. uh, probably within the zero to one and a half, because I okay. would assume that he, the baby's still breastfeeding, Matthew was, because oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so younger. Bonnie, yeah. so. Yeah, really weird. Um, no one seems really too affected by this. So then it, there's, a, there's a time jump, and they do this a couple times throughout the film, and the one thing I don't like is that they don't tell you how much time they're jumping. Because Yeah, I think you can, yeah, you have to sort of, you know, kind of figure it out based on how much the kids is, have aged. I mean, it looks like it's been a, probably two or three years in this first jump. Right? Yeah. So the kids are are older now. Bonnie's actually walking. She can talk, but she doesn't talk that much throughout the entire film. And the family's out 
in the um this beautiful field again they're all having a picnic this was can i just say this scene with the picnic how awesome is the scene here because they're they're picnicking in this really pretty field and there's like 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 ruins of an old castle or an old church around them i mean is this just is that what picnicking is like in the uk everywhere in, castles left and right it's insane right <laughs> i it's really pretty i think i thought the same thing that there there's ruins there's like a river um yeah really picturesque it looked really really cool so while they're doing their picnic thing all the kids are kind of playing around and then you hear mm-hmm. a shout for help Lucy, Mommy. their biological daughter, is calling for help. She's somewhere within the ruins. Um, Kate and Alan, they run out to help, obviously, from you know knowing that they've already lost one child, they can't afford to lose another. This leaves Bonnie with the two boys. The two boys are Sam and Davey. Right. Uh, two little redheaded kids. And I... I think it was Sam. He went to go like pick up a ball and Bonnie just rushes him and pushes him right down. Yeah. Knocks him right over the ball. So we With a weird s- smile too. I mean, yeah. that's, I feel like we've maybe not sold it up as well as we could have, but like up until like up until this point in the movie, they will like occasionally cut to Bonnie. And like you said, she doesn't talk a lot, but she has this, these sort of this kind of dead stare that the mother had, but she's smiling a lot. It's very, it's really unnerving. It's, it's almost like she's a living doll. She has this yeah, yeah. unnatural smile, which for a little child like that to be able to do, that's really awesome. Yeah, whoever they cast uh, throughout, you know, throughout the movie, the little girls that they cast as Bonnie are, are like, it's, it's kind of a hit or miss sometimes with, with child actors, but she, like, the actresses they got for these for the bonnies at various stages are really really good and they and they have a really creepy look to them in general like they've got this really this platinum blonde hair and this piercing blue eyes i mean it definitely sells the the character really well and you know what i do agree i think all the children in this movie did really well i'm generally not a fan of children in movies um because they usually try to stretch them in order to do stuff that children just wouldn't do or be on their their range yeah. yeah but they all were pretty much just acting like children in the film yeah, very believable. So Lucy is calling for help. Eventually, Alan and Kate find Lucy. She's up on some ruins. She's she's like a cat. She climbed too high, and now she can't get back <laughs> down. Right. Um, when they get back, Alan and Kate are wondering where the hell is Davy and Bonnie because they're they're nowhere to be found. And Sam was like, "Oh, I I walked off. I don't even know where the hell they went." <laughs> Which, again, really weird. So Alan and Kate are looking now for Davy and Bonnie. And eventually right. they come along to a river and they see Bonnie sitting by the river and she has some dirt and just crap on her. Yeah, she's kind of soaking wet and covered in mud. Something and happened. Alan's kind of looking out over, the, over into the water and he just jumps right into the water. Now, as he's jumping into the water, it cuts to Bonnie, and you can see on her forearm scratches and bruises. Okay, yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I don't know about you. I thought that was extremely effective. Yes. Because they don't they, – they, they hold on it just long enough for you to kind of figure out what it is, and, and they're clearly scratch marks. Oh, yeah. Definitely. It, it looked like – it it would be the scratch marks of someone trying to defend themselves against someone. Right. You know, exactly. Clawing at at someone. Yeah. Like clawing at them and you can sort of like see that they're clear, like, like finger width apart. I mean, it's, and they hold, like like I said, they hold on it just long enough for you to understand, like to kind of grasp what they are, but they don't linger on it where they're trying to like beat you over the head with what, what it is. I don't know. There's something about the way that they, that they did it. I found really, really effective. I, it was kind of it was definitely creepy. highly effective. I totally agree with you there. Yeah. Alan goes under the water. Now, it's kind of weird. I don't know how big or deep this, um, this river is supposed to be because there seems to be like a lot of brush in it as well. I it's could see... Like a pond how, almost. Yeah. Almost. And I could see how someone could get trapped underneath it because Alan does come back up with Davy. And... Alan immediately goes to work. He tries to give CPR. He tries to resuscitate mm-hmm. the child. And it's really weird because Kate has absolutely no reaction to no, the she's events just kind that are of, going on. 
I mean, I guess you could be charitable and say, oh, she's just kind of in shock and is not processing. I mean, it doesn't kind of look that way. Like she doesn't look like she's shocked. I mean, at this point you would have expected her having already lost a child to be sort of panicking, but yeah, it was kind of a weird non-reaction from her. And then Alan eventually gives up that Davy is dead. Drowned. And then after trying to do the CPR, Alan walks over to Bonnie and he does see, he acknowledges visually the bruises that are on Bonnie's arm. And right. he comes to the conclusion that he, she got these scratches and bruises from Davy trying to save her. Yeah, it's that was kind of an interesting observation. And I'm glad they did it that way because they, they show the audience first and we come to our conclusion. And then they have the character, like the parents give their reaction to it. And the fact that they come to what is you know, us as the audience is clearly the wrong conclusion, but they're so kind of blinded by the the parental aspect of it that they just assume, oh, certainly this little girl is not up to anything nefarious. You know, they're, she tried to save her brother or the brother tried to save her and it was kind of a tragic accident. So eventually they go back home. Alan and Kate are, Kate's crying. Alan is the stoic, fa- you know, husband, father figure. He's mm-hmm. being the rock for Kate. And I, I would say I kind of find, find it kind of odd. Alan's just going up to Kate like, don't cry. That, that's kind of like his, him trying to console her. Like, just <laughs> don't cry. It's not that bad. Even though they just lost a second child. Yeah. Uh, even though it's years, years apart, but they lost a second child. Yeah. Um, she kind of sells the, uh, I mean, this is why it was especially odd, the scene before where she didn't really seem to react at all. But in this scene, the, like the sobbing is really, it's really, really well done. I mean, you, you definitely feel for the mother. It's, it's weird that they didn't sort of give her more emotion in the moment when it happened. Uh, but I, I guess it's, I'll give the movie credit. I'm glad that they kind of like show her processing it now and she's just kind of breaking down. Exactly. Have you, lost two kids. have you ever seen Hereditary? Yes, that's exactly what it reminded yep. me of. That scene where she, the mother breaks down after spoilers for Hereditary, where she uh, finds out that her daughter got decapitated. That was probably one of the most effective scenes in that movie. Oh, oh it's gut wrenching. Yeah. So there's a little bit more time that goes on. Not a huge time jump, but just some time goes on. And Kate comes home to a broken dish and she goes up to Bonnie and she's like, Bonnie, did you break it? And this is actually the first time that we hear Bonnie speak. And she's like, no, I didn't. No, mommy. No, mommy. And the Kate's like, okay, where's your brother Sam at? Oh, he's in the tree house. So Kate (laughs) goes over to Sam. She starts asking him like, Hey, did you break this? And Sam goes, no, I didn't. And Bonnie gives sam the evil eye big evil eye which she's sort of like we've seen her do this before but she actually is directing it right at sam at this point and sam kind of puts his head down and i thought like there was some the way that it 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 seems the way that it looks it's like she has some psychic abilities and she's almost forcing sam to admit guilt to something that he didn't do but I, I think it's just like an intimidation game where Bonnie's like, I'm yeah. going to kick the crap out of you later. Yeah, definitely. At this point, I wasn't, I wasn't completely sure whether or not there was some kind of supernatural element to this little girl yet. Or like what kind of, because like we haven't really established what the rules of the movie are at this point. But I got the same impression that like, I was wondering if there was some kind of, you know, some kind of psychic projection or some, something supernatural going on. But you're right. I, I think it's just, it's, it's, it's intimidation that we haven't seen intimidation factor. Did you also notice that the family owns goats, multiple goats? I didn't. Are they off in the background? Uh, when Kate is walking towards the, uh, the tree house, there are uh, okay. like four or five goats <laughs> just kind of walking around their backyard, eating grass like and stuff like that. Oh my God. How great would that be? <laughs> so Kate is like, you know, you're lying, blah, blah, blah. Bonnie's mm-hmm. doing the intimidation game to Sam. Um, and then down. we kind of get the same scene over again. Alan comes home. He finds mm-hmm. a broken toy helicopter and he picks it up and he's walking around and he sees from a distance Sam push 
Bonnie down. And Alan right. just zooms in there and just starts smacking Sam on his butt, going like, what are oh, you doing? Yeah. Why are you picking on your little sister? Uh, and that's one thing that Alan does bring up. He's like, your sister's so much smaller. She's a shrimp. She's you half know. your size. She couldn't do anything to hurt you. Exactly. Uh, so Sam gets sent to her room. Alan's talking to Bonnie, trying to, you know, console her. And she's hiding something behind her back. And even Alan mm-hmm. acknowledges that there's something behind her back. And she's like, Alan's like, show me. Show me what you have behind your back. And Bonnie's like, nope. No, and Alan Bonnie. goes, okay. <laughs> and the, the camera pans around Bonnie. And it's, it's a tuft of Sam's hair. Yeah, because he, he, he complained to the dad. He's like, Bonnie was hurting me. She was pulling my hair. And that's when he's like, oh, you know, kind of brushing it off. She's, she's half your size. She couldn't do that. And then, yeah, you, you, like you said, they pan around and she drops a big like handful of his like bright red hair. Exactly. Oh, that, would, that had to have hurt. And then Alan goes to Sam's room and he's tucking him in or kissing him goodnight. And he, mm-hmm. he notices there's blood and there is hair missing out of the back of his child's head oh yeah like a big chunk of scalp i mean she got a like good handful off of his head exactly and if this was reality and i was living it this is where the movie would end because i would be giving bonnie up i would be like you just hurt my son my biological son there's something wrong with this child like oh yeah it's time to give up the child Definitely at this point, I mean, at the very least, you're taking the daughter to a doctor or to a child psychologist to like something is clearly wrong. Siblings, you know, biological or not, typically don't aren't that violent. Yeah, like you would you would be you would be putting everything on hold and figuring that out if you actually cared. You kind of have, you know, you, you have fights, but to rip someone's hair out and cause and lie about it, bleeding and lie about it at yeah. probably like four years old. That's. That's Jeffrey Dahmer territory right there. <laughs> That's some real proto serial killer shit. <laughs> but Alan and Kate just don't care right now. This is fine. Because they live the sweet life over in England. And it seems like every day is a day off for them. Uh, because the next Having day, picnics and Alan whatnot. and Kate are spreading out the picnic blanket again. And they're making out in the backyard. Uh <laughs> And I think it was I think it was about this point too where they're all like you said they're having another picnic in the backyard and I think the doctor comes by briefly to to say hi. Um but I, did you notice uh Bonnie she I think at this point she's been walking around like a blankie yes. a, for a couple scenes that blanket is the shawl that the creepy mother had mm. brought with her to the house and she almost left it behind in the in the earlier on in the other day oh don't forget your shawl as he goes to you know go drive her home. That's that same, it's the same shawl. Good looking out there. So there's kind of like a, a connection between Bonnie and the stranger mom. Right, the, the biological they just, mom. They just don't know it. Nope. Interesting. Sorry, a little, little side note. There Do you think Alan and Kate kind of gave it to Bonnie going like, oh, she should have something of her mother's? That's kind of what I was thinking. Because I mean, I, I wish I, I should go back to the scene where like earlier on in the movie where they, they show the mom kind of you know, the Kate walking into the room and just seeing the baby and the, the biological mom is missing. And they kind of pan around the, the bedroom at that point. I, I want to go back and look and see if the blanket or the shawl had been left on the bed, but that's kind of what I assumed. Like you said, is that they just hit, you know, that's, that's all they had for the biological mother. So they figured, Oh, you know, maybe that'd be a nice, a nice memento of this, creepy woman who gave up her child so quickly kind of like I ha- guess. how superman is he has all the cloth for his uh superman suit when he gets sent to earth from krypton and <laughs> it's like a symbol right oh, yes the godsend superman shared cinematic universe exactly <laughs> uh so alan and kate are in the backyard kissing loving each other and bonnie goes over to Sam's tree house and Sam's like, essentially like, you're not going to come up here. And Bonnie sees Alan and Kate kissing. And this pisses her off. Clearly, even in just the, the creepy stare, there's enough nuance there where she's, she's not having that. Yeah. Really weird. And then Bonnie suggests that they play hide and seek. Uh, everyone wants to play except for their son, Sam. Sam is like, I don't want to play. I don't like Bonnie. And if we are going to play, I want to stay with mom. Yeah. 
Allen. Clearly very, I mean, they, they, they think they've really established well with Sam so far that he is just scared shitless of his, his, you know, adopted sister. Exactly. And Alan gives no mind to that, even though he knows that Sam's hair has been ripped out. Alan mm-hmm. is like, well, if you're going to ruin the day, you know, kind of giving <laughs> Sam crap yeah, for he's, not he's wanting to play. It, yeah. I forget about that. So Alan is going to be it. Everyone goes and runs off into their own hiding spots. And you see Sam go into the woods in a little bit, you know, a couple seconds later, you see Bonnie enter the scene and she kind of looks five degrees left of center camera as if she's kind of looking at the audience going, I'm about to go kill Sam. (laughs) Yeah. Right. I mean, it's okay. This is, this is the part that I really wanted to talk about because it's, the movie this so far is kind of bright and sunny and there's kind of this idyllic landscape. But at this point, it's sort of like it's the, the, the visual tone of it stays the same. But at this point, it kind of like when she comes in and you see her following where Sam had gone to hide and she kind of does that sort of not quite look to the camera. I mean, it's almost it's almost like a slasher movie in this one scene where you see her and like you, the audience knows exactly what's going to happen. Like it's clear that this this little girl is either directly or indirectly killing the other kids in this family. Exactly. And, and the fact that you know what's coming, it, it's like watching a slasher movie. It's like watching Michael Myers stalk teenagers in a house. Yeah. Only she's stalking her, her other brother. It's really, really well done. And I, I wouldn't expect the movie to kind of like leave it to a mystery, but I, I do find it odd that they're, they're playing those cards just right up front. They're like, yeah, there is no doubt. Bonnie is the bad guy. Oh, yeah. I think that and the, the tension is coming from the fact that we, the audience, see it, but it takes so long for the, the, the other people in the movie to sort of get hip to it, which is, I mean, yeah, like I said, that's where the tension comes from. It's like, you know, okay, like, when is she going to strike next? How is she going to do it? How is she going to split them up so she could like be alone with one of the kids, which is up to this point, it's clear that that's what she's been doing intentionally all along is to just try and, you know, get them alone so she can fake an accident or something. But yeah, I mean, it, it's weirdly like a slasher movie in that regard where that's that's kind of divide and conquer and she's, she's behaving like a serial killer. It's really creepy. Very effective. So Alan is running around and he finds Kate first and him and his wife kind of make out again a little bit and alan's like okay let's go find the others alan finds Mm -hmm. lucy and then he finds bonnie and bonnie's alan goes hey bonnie what happened to the blue ribbon in your hair and she's like i don't know daddy i don't know daddy and everyone starts getting a little keyed up because they can't find sam right goes on a little bit too long they're getting worried they check the tree house he's not there they check a couple other places he's not there eventually alan goes into the woods and then he finds a barn tons of hay bales and stuff uh alan climbs up the top of the hay bales and then he sees it you don't see it at first mm-hmm. it's sam sam's dead Yep, kind of splayed out on the on the floor of the barn. Clearly had fallen from... I mean, he's when he climbs to the top of that haystack, I mean, he's probably 15, 20 feet up, and there's like a, like, a, like a ledge that you could very easily fall over, especially pretty dangerous as a kid, and that's clearly what's happened. As Alan picks up Sam's dead body, we see Bonnie's blue ribbon. So we can, we can now connect. Alan has said, Bonnie, where's your blue ribbon? Blue ribbon is next to Sam's dead body. Okay. We, the audience, have seen this, and we acknowledge that Bonnie is definitely the killer. I pause the movie, Greg. We are 40 minutes in, and there are three dead kids. We are averaging one dead kid every 13 (laughs) minutes and 30 seconds. That's a really grim statistic. Yes. But the fact, like, again, it's, it's, like you said, it's not something that you see a lot in, in horror movies, you know, kids being the target of killing, and it's the fact that we realize at this point that it's another kid doing it, you almost don't think about it that they're all children, but like it's, it's, it's weirdly creepy and effective, but not in kind of like an offensive way. It is kind of odd, right? Like we're seeing these children die, but it's kind of, since I think because we don't see the act of them getting killed, it kind of disconnects it just a little right. bit. 
Um, but at that point when I paused it and I acknowledged that there's three dead children, I did look up 53,000 children die each year in the United States. Now it doesn't say exactly how they die. Just any, any cause disease or accident, but it does say from, um, metroparent.com. That is the, oh. the statistic that they are giving me. A so source. there's a little grim fact for everyone. Um, yeah. Oh, so man. one dead child every 13 minutes, 30 seconds. Kate is in bed. She's very sad. Obviously, she has now lost three children. And uh, here's another thing. You have three children that have died. Right. When do the cops come? When does someone come to you and go, <laughs> When are your children going to stop dying? Yeah, like that's another thing, and they and I think they kind of allude to it a little bit, where that where they kind of get like a neighbor leaving them an anonymous note saying like we, showing that that they're kind of other people in this country town kind of are suspecting something is not right with the parents, like they kind of like suspect them of killing their kids almost. They don't they don't lean into it very hard, but you would think that in the real world, that's ex- like you said, that's exactly what would happen. The police would be getting involved, child services someone from the authorities would be saying okay this is not normal for <laughs> all of these kids to ha- you know to to come to uh, an early end through accident or something it's just yeah yeah not a little suspicious very odd alan goes back to the scene where sam has died and he finds bonnie's ribbon so now alan is he's kind of seen the scratches and the bruises on bonnie's arm he's now found bonnie's missing blue ribbon from her hair right um and we kind of cut back to the family they're all together now it's just bonnie and lucy those are the only children that are left now and Lucy just doesn't seem affected by this at all. She's actually trying to cheer up the mom and stuff. She's lost two brothers that she knew and the infant uh, brother. Yeah. Just very odd that it almost seems Kate is being the only one emotionally affected by all of this. And this is actually the part, Greg, where Kate finds the letter that is insinuating that she has killed her children. Okay, that's when it happens. Yeah. And it's narrated by just some random voice. You don't hear it from the perspective of Kate reading it. You hear it from the perspective of the person who wrote it, who is not in the film. Yeah, that was a weird choice. I wasn't sure if it was like maybe the dad's voice that they just dubbed over poorly. Like it was him reading it, but it was off camera. I was, it didn't click until after the scene was over that, oh, that was just, you know, that was kind of uh, outside the universe of the movie. That was just like a narration, like a voiceover that, yeah, again, some... I mean, maybe it was the doctor. Maybe I guess I, I don't know. I mean, like you said, it was anonymous, and we don't we don't know who sent it. So it's yeah, we have no idea if it's a character we've seen so far. Although we haven't seen a lot of adult characters in general. So after they kind of calm down after the letter, Alan asks, you know, what can I do, Kate? How can I help you? And maybe you just need to go back to work. <laughs> and that's when we, we learned that Kate actually works in TV. She was like an actress or a writer or something. She works in TV. They didn't really go into too, na- too many specifics of what exactly no, she did. Yeah. They kind of allude to it a little bit where, like you said in the beginning, where they, oh, maybe people just know us here. And that was kind of like a throwaway line. You're, you, it didn't really register for me until later that, oh, maybe she, like, she's kind of a well-known personality in some regard yeah maybe she's an actress or something so it's the next day alan's at work he's he's kind of like a an artist they say earlier in the film that he's an artist but he's in the office he's talking to some people it doesn't really matter what's happening the real important part is that kate's at home and she's some very pushy reporter is trying to you know write something about the fact that all of her children are dying yeah getting a scoop now it's odd because alan does show up eventually and kate goes i asked this man three times to leave now greg they're outside (laughs) kate could have just closed the door just close the door in his fucking face yeah how I, i just find it really odd again she's emotionally distraught so maybe she's not thinking clearly but alan being the you know the great husband that that he is it's essentially like i will kick the shit out of you if you don't oh yeah right now gets really put like just throws him off a lawn basically which is i mean it was weird because 
I think that maybe this is just a function of the of of us sympathizing so much with the parents at this point. But as soon as you realize like what's happening, this reporter guy is just being super pushy and clearly upsetting both of the parents. I, I just immediately hated this guy. And it was it was really kind of weirdly satisfying to see the dad throw him off. Yes. Off the lawn. The guy's even like, you can't do this. I'll do something. <laughs> Alan's like, I don't care. Get out of here. <laughs> Get off my property. So Alan and Kate, they kind of talk and they, they come to the conclusion that it's time for a change. And there's another time jump here. And they all now live in London. Now, right. when you see the kids again, when you see Lucy and Bonnie... They looked a lot older, right? Yeah, it definitely seemed like a bigger time jump this time because I think the first one we said was what two or three years, and they look quite a bit older now. I think like Lucy looks like she's probably ten or eleven years old now, maybe, right? Yeah, it's it's weird because when I was looking at the credits and I was reading stuff, it's the same kids. They just like I guess put wigs Wait, on what? them and made really? them look older. So there's a there's huh. a baby Bonnie that's credited and then there's bonnie and then there's younger lucy and lucy in the film so they must have just changed like their hairdo or something like that to make them look older that that's that's really surprising because i I was actually just gonna say that i I think i mentioned before that the acting or the casting with the kids is, is great across the board but they really did a good job making them look kind of like physically like appearance wise very consistent they all kind of look like they could be the same kid just aged up a couple of years each jump yeah but i mean i guess either yeah it was either really good casting or like you said it was just legitimately the same the same kid who was just you know wigged up or something exactly because i'm looking at imdb now and i'm looking at wikipedia and it just has bonnie bonnie as a baby sure. really weird um they did a really okay. good job making them definitely look older so yeah, now well they're done. They're in London and Kate, at least this initial few scenes or few minutes that we get to spend with them. She seems a little more disconnected. She seems a little more harsh towards Lucy, towards Bonnie, um, kind of more demanding while Alan is still the loving father. Uh, Yeah. There's kind of like a... Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, like, I think this was... Even though they, they they didn't really show the parents emoting quite as much as you would expect them to, given what happens earlier on the movie, I think they they kind of corrected that a little bit as we go on because you definitely can tell that the mother is, is becoming unhinged and you know all of these kind of tragedies that have happened in in their lives have kind of taken their toll on her. It's it's pretty definitely credit to the actress who played the mother, but I mean it was it definitely kind of you can see it's adding up over time and the way that she's kind of acting around the kids now. And then there's a montage of them just kind of doing stuff, but eventually it's Christmas time. And this I found really odd. They have a real tree and part of their Christmas decorations is that they're putting candles on the tree and lighting them. <laughs> okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you noticed that too, because I feel like such a doofus for pointing this out in all these movies, but I'm like all of these movies from the seventies and eighties, all of these things that were probably really normal then just, I'm just like screaming safety hazard in my head. That's all I was thinking is like, why are you lighting candles in a Christmas tree? That's a fire hazard. No, man. I feel the same exact way. (laughs) It is. It's wood. Wood catches on fire. Why would you be lighting candles and putting them on as Christmas ornaments? Yeah, exactly. Like even if it didn't catch the tree on fire, I mean, I guess if it's a real tree and it's green wood, it maybe wouldn't burn that well, but the, the house was clearly carpeted and there was, curtains and furniture all over the place like come on guys fire hazard it was like it was like all the teenagers not wearing seat belts and gas pump girls exactly it just sticks out like a sore thumb yeah it's definitely one of those things where you you realize that it's a different era a different yeah. time <laughs> times have changed uh kate is feeling a little more loving at this moment and alan and kate embrace and they kiss and through the flames of the christmas tree we see bonnie <laughs> and Bonnie is pissed that Giving they're kissing the stick again. Eye. Yeah, it's kind of that same stare we saw, you know, years, you know, years in the movie earlier, where the mom and the husband were clearly, you know, affectionate towards one another. And yeah, daughter is evil. Bonnie is clearly not having that. She does. She does not like them being intimate in any way. So, and then we cut to Alan and Kate. They're about to get busy in bed, mm-hmm. and Bonnie calls out, "Mom, mommy." mommy and 
Kate comes back with Bonnie and she's like, oh, she just wants to sleep with us tonight. And even Alan goes, she <laughs> wants to keep us apart. <laughs> even Alan's like, you gotta be shitting me. Yeah, I felt really bad for Alan at this point. I, I was like, I, I can feel where you're coming from. Um, yeah. I, I definitely would be upset if that was happening to me. So Alan is kind of just sitting there getting really upset. And then it cuts to Alan and Kate making out next to their sleeping daughter. Yeah, that was, I noticed that too. That was a little odd. Like they were about to start to get busy again with the daughter in the bed. And I mean, I don't know if they saw it or not, but like she's clearly awake. Yeah. And, you know, doing her usual creepy stare right at the dad. Because she eventually she goes, mommy. And they they both stop making <laughs> out. Really, really, yeah, really weird. I wouldn't... I guess- I would never even that that thought would never even cross my head if my child was in my bed. No, Um, yeah, that's a really weird choice. So I guess it's just been that long. Yeah, I guess (laughs) Alan and Kate really need to, you know, they really need to have some uh, some alone time. Some alone time. Yep. And then the next morning, it's it's actually Alan and Kate's anniversary, and Alan's like, "Oh, I cleaned out the junk room." And then he gives her a pen and Kate's like, oh, I didn't get you anything for our anniversary except for sex. And Alan and Kate finally have sex with each other. I was actually really happy for them. Um, and then the phone rings. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's like, God damn it. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, Kate's like, oh, it's, uh, you know, one of the teachers, Bonnie isn't feeling well. Her head hurts. Yeah. So Kate inspects Bonnie. She's like, go to sleep. You'll be fine. And then there's an offhanded conversation between Alan and Kate. And it turns out that Bonnie has the mumps. Right. Which is, I mean, that's not really a thing nowadays. That I, mean, I think that's something we're all vaccinated against, but maybe I'm sure it was I, I'm more common then. So it, it would seem like a, you know, a plausible kid childhood illness. So you, the movie was made in 1980. The MMR, which MMR, is for yeah. measles, mumps, and rubella, was rubella. created in 1963. <laughs> I, I, okay, I got nothing then. I guess they just weren't, they were anti vaxxing parents. I guess. Parents. So, mumps is best known for puffy cheeks and tender, swollen jaws. Uh, you can get a fever, a headache, muscle ache, tiredness, loss of appetite. It's a viral infection. So, once you get it, there's really nothing that they can do in order to mm-hmm. cure you. It just takes time, which yeah, after five gross. days, you're not contagious anymore. But it takes at least two weeks for you to uh, become perfectly fine. Now, there's mm-hmm. a couple other things that can happen to you if you get the mumps and we'll find out that alan actually does get a couple of these uh whether there's whether or not there's a consequence in the movie for it not really well maybe we'll see maybe yeah so you can get testicular pain from it and you can actually go partially deaf from it because your cochlear will swell and it can cause damage um, and in women, it can cause their ovaries to swell, which if they don't have a child, they're fine. But if they're pregnant, it increases the chances of them having a miscarriage. Now, I did not see anything about becoming sterile from having the mumps. But let's go ahead and we'll talk about the movie again. So Bonnie has the mumps. And right. they're quarantining her in the bedroom. They're doing great. They're quarantining no masks, which we know is a big no-no nowadays. <laughs> um, but yeah, just twenty twenty things. Exactly. Uh, Kate <laughs> does mention to Alan. She's like, "Oh, Bonnie's been asking for you." And Alan is pretty much like, "I don't give a shit what Bonnie is <laughs> asking for. She's sick. I don't want to be anywhere near her because I don't want to get sick. Because obviously, right. Alan's older. He doesn't want to get the bumps because there probably can be complications. You know, the older you get, even." Right, you know, little colds can can knock you out. So Alan is sleeping one morning, and Bonnie sneaks into his room and kisses him while he's sleeping, twice. Yeah, I was gonna say a couple times, and I mean it's clear at this point this evil little girl is intentionally trying to infect her father. Which Jesus, 
it is so creepy watching this it, part happen. Yeah. And again, I mean, credit to everyone who made the movie, but the fact that it's something, it's a conclusion that you as the audience come to, but is not like spelled out in any kind of obvious way, except for in her, like the little girl's body language and a couple offhand comments in the previous scene about how dangerous it is for adults to get the mumps. And the fact, like, as soon as you see her, you know, you know, oh, the other mom says, oh, she's been asking you. She wants to see you really bad. And and the fact that you see her kind of creeping into the room, you know it, you know, like, you know exactly what's going to happen. And it's, yeah, extremely creepy. You definitely don't want to see it, but you know what's going to happen. If I was going to make the film, she would like spit in a cup or something that he was drinking out of. It wouldn't be this really awkward scene. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like she kisses him on the lips a couple times. It was... I mean, I guess it, if you want to infect someone, that's that, that that's the one way to do it. And then it turns into this really weird scene of Alan is sick and he starts hallucinating things, actually. Yeah, like a f- weird fever dream. He's hallucinating Bonnie and the dead children. And it's like his mind is connecting Bonnie to all these horrible, tragic events. And uh, when eventually the dream is over the doctor and kate are there and standing over the bed over him yep and the doctor is like okay it looks like he's pulling through and he goes how's the pain down there and (laughs) helen goes uh it still kind of hurts but i'm slightly deaf in my right ear and he's like yeah that's because of mumps you can that can happen and alan goes yeah you can also go sterile from the mumps as well uh-huh so there there's a big wink, plot wink. point right there that we're going to stomp our foot on uh, eventually alan gets better and he takes the kids out to a park now this park looks all sorts of dangerous you are the the uh, safety conscious guy here <laughs> there's like, i'm so happy you noticed it too there's like a rope swing that people are going down like it, it's almost like it's on a track as well right yeah, it was it was almost like it was like a combination rope swing and zip line almost. Really weird. Never seen yeah. anything like this. Again, this is the, the, the early 80s. It might as well be 70s. Yeah. So it's it reminds me of all those um those really great wooden playgrounds that were prevalent when we were kids and, and before up to that point, um, that they've all kind of sort of sort of started to tear down in the past decade or so. And but even even as far as old wooden playgrounds go, this one looked like a you know. It was just really nasty looking. Like there was like the wood looked all splintery, and it looks like you're going to get an infection or two from it. <laughs> um, Mumps part two. But Lucy and Bonnie, they decide that they're going to go swinging, and Bonnie is pushing Lucy on the swing. Alan goes to sit underneath a tree. He's tired. He's still probably recovering from the illness. Bonnie goes towards the end of the swing set and she picks up one of the swings and kind of like domino hits all these swings together Mm -hmm. to where it hits Lucy's swing and she starts losing control and it starts like swinging around. Yeah. I think that I think the swings get all tangled up around her and she's spinning around. And I thought this was the only hokey part in the entire film. Yeah. It's a little hokey. Alan runs over, saves her. He sees Bonnie actually do this act and saves Lucy. Now I say saves Lucy, Lucy very <laughs> loosely because I don't think there was any mortal danger from this at all. No, yeah, it was like you said, it was hokey. The fact that this could be a life threatening situation. I mean, worst case, she would fall off the swing and like hit her head. But yeah, it was. It didn't look like you know as precarious as some of the other scenes where we've seen Bonnie. You know, I mean, drowning her one brother, pushing her other brother off of like a tall barn. Exactly. This was a little dodgy. And they go home. Alan confronts Kate and essentially spills all the beans. And he's like, I saw Bonnie try to kill Lucy. Now, mm-hmm. I will give Kate this. I would not believe my spouse either. If they were like, hey, they pushed a swing into the kid, it could have killed him. I'd have been like, uh, no. You shit me. But yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely understandable that she was a little. Uh, uh, you know, not not really believing what he was saying. And I think and I think he even says as much. Like, oh, you're just you're just blinded by your maternal instincts. I mean, for the other stuff maybe, but 
in this case, no one's dying falling off a swing set. Come on, dude. But Alan, then he does start laying out some other facts. He's like the scratches right. on Bonnie's arms. That was because Sam was trying to defend himself. I saw the blue ribbon next to uh, Michael. I think I'm getting the kid's name. The other kid. Davy. Davy. When he was dead, um, you know, then he just tried to hurt Lucy. You know, he w- she was there when Michael died in the crib. He's kind of laying out all these facts. And yeah. Kate is re- refusing to believe that their horrible string of bad luck was brought on anything other than just bad luck. Right. Accidents. So, Alan, being a, a good father, he's like, I'm going to protect our only biological child that we have left then. And he takes Lucy out to the countryside, essentially. They're out next to uh you know some water they're buying candy yeah they're getting the the morning paper and i thought this was again this was another realization that kate is famous even though they don't really talk about it that much Mm -hmm. in the film because kate has been into an accident and it's actually made the paper it's like former tv actress hospitalized and right alan's (laughs) like oh my god we have to go back home yeah, the fact that like this is how they learn of it. I mean, it's it's I, this is another something that they don't really talk about directly too much, but it's it's it becomes clear that the father is basically hiding Lucy from Bonnie, obviously, but also from Kate. Like he has not told her where they were or where they were going. Yeah, and has basically cut off contact entirely. It's kind of, and I think I, I'm not sure if it, I think this is the where it's happened where he's kind of like gave Kate an ultimatum where she's saying like that's you know, right it's 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 either bonnie or lucy like you have to choose and i'm gonna protect lucy at all costs because clearly something is wrong with bonnie and you're refusing to admit it now i understand that when you adopt a child they become part of your family that is your child but you do have to realize that you know if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck it probably is a duck it probably is a demon child <laughs> and you know if all your children are dying except for the the creepy one that you adopted, maybe there's something wrong with the creepy child that you adopted. Yeah. Again, I mean, if this were real life, you would have long since taken Bonnie to see a doctor or to have some, some kind of t- tests done just to like see what was up. The fact that they, this is another part in the movie where you're wondering why that hasn't happened yet. Exactly. So Alan goes back uh, to see Kate. He leaves Lucy at the, uh, she who does he lives her with like a the uh the innkeeper or the the maid or something like that of their old yeah. house yeah something like a neighbor or something or yeah, doesn't like really matter who he lives them with yeah some adult but alan shows up to the doctor's office and he's talking to a nurse and the nurse tells alan that yeah your wife she tripped on a top of a toy like a, a doll from right. the top of the stairs and she fell down in the course of her falling down the stairs she had a miscarriage oh and alan's yeah, like she was pregnant exactly alan's like i didn't know that she was pregnant she never told me that and the the nurse kind of like <laughs> just walks away kind of like okay <laughs> that's weird um <laughs> right really so so he, he walks away and then alan is in a, a room with uh, wait, I think I'm missing, I'm missing something up here. I'm missing a crucial, crucial piece here. Oh, Alan, he's in an office drawing a picture of Bonnie now. And it turns into a dream sequence. And you can tell that it's a dream sequence because the four corners of the film turn uh, oh, yeah. fuzzy. It's kind of blurry yeah, that they kind of do like a weird lensing effect. I hate dream sequences in movies. And this is a key example why. Because it doesn't progress the story through the dream. It just does nothing. It's just there to go, we need seven more minutes of this movie. Oh, you didn't like the scene? I, 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 I actually quite liked it. I liked the scene, but I really wish that that was the ending. I wish yeah. that is what the ending was. Yeah, I think the fact that it was a dream is... You're right. That was the problem because it 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 sets up, or it re like it kind of reaffirms the fact that the father has strong suspicions and he's he's basically gonna try like okay, no one's doing anything about Bonnie. I have to 
take her away from the family. And he doesn't really come out and say that he's going to take her out and kill her. But you sort of, the way that the, the dream is kind of shown is that's that's kind of what he wants to do. Like he's he's so desperate that he's willing to just, you know, take her out to the ocean and leave her out on the rocks to, I guess, drown or something. But Exactly. And that's that's exactly what the dream sequence is. Alan leads Bonnie out onto a rock in the sea and the sea level is rising. And Alan's like, I know, you know, I and I know you know that I know that you killed all my kids. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, how great of an ending this would have been. Yeah, you're right. I, I see what you mean. That would have been a really satisfying ending. But he comes out of the dream and the doctor from earlier in the film shows up and he's kind of talking with Alan just about the events of all the children dying and how weird it is. And then Kate enters the room out of nowhere. And she's like, I want a divorce. Yeah, the geography of that whole part is kind of uh, confusing. I assume that's his his London office where he does all of his artwork. And I think it's because the movie is coming to a head, right? It's coming to the end, so we need to bring all of the the two plot lines together. Yeah, to go forward, we need to resolve the Alan and Kate issue, and then we also need to solve the Bonnie issue. Now, the body issue. Alan, again, he goes. Bonnie is evil and he lays out all the facts again. And then he goes, Bonnie wants you for herself and she's willing to kill any of our children and any of our future children in order to make that happen. She's the one who put the toy at the top of the stairs, a toy that she never plays with. And you fell down and had a miscarriage. And Kate goes, well, we could just have another child. And Alan goes, no, I'm sterile because of the mumps. I got... You don't get any more kids for me. I got a test. So now we can never have any, any kids. And it almost seems like Kate is coming around. A little bit, yeah. She's like acknowledging that Bonnie is evil. And Kate, for some reason, realizes that Lucy came home early. And she's decided to leave Lucy and Bonnie alone with each other which alan immediately freaks out about alan's like how could you do this how could you leave those two alone and even this is after the discussion they had of how evil bonnie is (laughs) kate goes why why is it such a big deal and i'm just saying to myself oh my god you are so dense yeah it's i I, it's either density or just really really crazy denial that she's in right now because the, she like you're right like you said she's she's sort of kind of starts to come around when he's explaining all of these weird things that have happening and yeah you know, yeah like you said laying out the facts of why this little girl is obviously evil and is killing their children and you can sort of see it in her eyes that she's starting to like admit it to herself but she yeah, takes a hard left turn back into into, into denial territory yeah. she totally regresses and alan pushes her out of the way she calls lucy and it was like lucy you need to get out of the house and lucy goes well the door is locked now greg what the fuck is going on in the 80s where you need a key to get out the front door i can so okay so i was wondering that too and the only thing i can think of is is in, in my house when I was a kid, there was a, I think it was the back door had, it was a, like a deadbolt, but it was, it wasn't like a, it had like a, like a permanent handle on the inside. It was actually keyed from the inside and the outside. And I'm assuming that was just a thing with older locks that maybe they just don't do anymore. But I'm assuming that's what, was the, what the case was here. Like the, the door had been locked, the deadbolt had been locked, and then the key had been pulled out from the inside so that you couldn't unlock it. That's insane. That's, that's an insane thing to have. I don't think yeah. I've ever seen that. And out of all the the safety issues that we've seen in movies, this is the one that <laughs> terrifies me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I'm assuming that's why they don't do it anymore because I can't say I've seen it anywhere but that spot in my entire life. And I, yeah, I'm assuming, I mean, if nothing else, it's a, it feels like a, another fire hazard. Like, yeah. What if you're trying to get out really quick? Like poor Lucy is trying, trying to do right now. Oh, the key's gone. Well, I guess... I hope I can break the door down because otherwise I'm not getting out. And that's what Lucy's trying to do. She's trying to find this key so she can escape from Bonnie. And Bonnie eventually rips the phone line or hangs up the phone. Alan is freaking out. And he turns to Kate and goes, 
either you're going to run with me or you're going to stay here. I don't give a shit. And he makes a beeline <laughs> for the car. Eventually, Kate does join him. We see right. them, you know, driving through London, trying to get to the house. Um, yeah exactly there's you know this is like the most actiony part of the entire yeah, film chase music alan and kate they pull up they see lucy at the top of their house through right. a window she opens up the window alan's like get the fuck away from the open window don't open the window and this is the weird thing because kate is seeing everything that is happening right now it's not like kate is still in the car or kate's reading a book or Kate got distracted by something. <laughs> she is seeing the same actions that Alan is right now. Lucy gets pushed out the window. No one tries to go and grab her. That's the insane part to me. No one's yeah. running over there to try to grab her or break the fall. They could probably save Lucy, but Lucy hits the pavement. She's dead. No. Bunny pushed Lucy out the window and she turned into a dummy. Exactly. Oh, a horrible dummy. <laughs> it, this was a really bad dummy shot. Yeah. This was even worse than when Hans Ruber turns into a dummy at, in Die Hard. It, it was, it was <laughs> immediately just floppy arm syndrome. Yeah. It was so horrible. Uh, Alan's holding, or Alan runs into the house and he finds Bonnie. He's like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and I'll kill you. Chases her up nice. That's the thing right there. Uh, <laughs> Alan runs up the <laughs> stairs and holds Bonnie down. The neighbor comes out of nowhere and is like, Alan, stop. You're crazy. Uh, Kate gets upstairs and Bonnie goes, I love you, mommy. Daddy's trying to kill me. And Kate sides with Bonnie. Yeah, you can sort of see because she Kate will pa pause for a second and she kind of like looks at both of them and She's clearly making a choice right there, and, and she, she chooses Bonnie. It's insane. It's so insane. She just saw her daughter die. Yeah. I, the only thing that I can think of, and, and maybe this it was intentional or not, I'm not sure, but the only thing I can think of is to sort of explain her weird roller coaster of, of emotion through the entire movie where she'll react to some things but not others is there's there's some kind of either supernatural or not some kind of weird spell that Bonnie has put on the mother to sort of suppress any kind of emotion about any other child except for her. Yeah. That, that's the only thing I can think of. I mean, maybe I'm being charitable to the, to the movie, but that's the only thing I can think of it. That would make sense is to be able to explain why, like you said, she doesn't really seem to be terribly, you know, upset when she sees her daughter plunging from like a 10 story window but she is deciding with Bonnie and is very like protective of her. It's so weird. Yeah. Very strange. So weird. Uh, there's a little bit of a time jump. It doesn't really matter how much time Alan is out in a, in a park area. He's talking with the doctor from earlier in the film. They're kind of going over the entire situation about how Kate has left Alan. She's with Bonnie, how Bonnie only really wants to be with Kate. Right. And then Alan notices the stranger from across the pond from across the pond yes it's the woman from the very beginning of the film who is pregnant and the stranger is pregnant again and she's talking with another family and alan goes oh my god that's her i have to stop her and right. so she starts he starts running towards the family and he loses them Yep, they kind of disappear. The the creepy woman walks off. It looked like it was like um just a mother, and she had maybe three or four kids with her, one in a stroller, and they kind of walk off together. And that's when he starts chasing them, and they just kind of disappear into the park, and he he loses them. And that's how the movie ends. Alan has failed. He has yep. failed to save the world. Uh, because I'm assuming that Bonnie will eventually turn into one of these creepy women who have evil, horrible children that kill. Oh, entire okay. that's, families. That's a so is it, you you mentioned you mentioned earlier that the the part where you know the dad is leaving Bonnie off by the ocean like that would have been a really great ending too. But actually, I I really liked this ending too. The fact that you see the creepy lady from the beginning again, and she's clearly doing the same thing. She's she's planting another evil child with another family, and like you see it kind of happening all over again. But I didn't think that's a really cool theory that you just mentioned there, which I didn't didn't occur to me that the 
Bonnie would grow up to be someone like that to kind of perpetuate this this chain of of evil children kind of usurping the the parents and killing off the other kids. And you know why? Because and I we forgot to say this or I forgot to say it earlier in the film. Alan he compares Bonnie to the cuckoo bird, where a cuckoo bird oh, right. will right, actually yeah. lay eggs inside of other nests and then kill the other eggs, forcing or allowing the you know the the host parents to raise their own child like raise a child that's not theirs oh that's right i forgot about that that's that's a really kind of yeah i mean that's because that does a perfect job of explaining what you know you as the audience know exactly what's going on at this point where yeah she's just trying to kill off the other kids so that she can get 100 percent you know undivided mom, mommy time basically so have you ever seen the omen Yes, yes, well, I have. Well, which one? I mean, obviously, it's it's almost the same film. Evil child killing people around it in order to get into a position of power, or at least in a position to where they're safe, right? Yeah, um, exactly. And they both kind of end on the same note where Damien lives. Yeah, basically, the, the kid wins. Yeah. Essentially. So, do, I mean, do you like movies in which? evil wins over good in this genre definitely i i i like i said i i quite like the ending to this because i think the, it, it shows that the parents were basically powerless the whole time and they really were and it wasn't i mean this guy came to the conclusion that the kid is evil way too late and it's and the fact that you see it happening again just reinforces the fact that yeah this this is happened it's going to happen again it happened to you it's probably been happening for a while and there's nothing you can do about it it's this evil force that you are not equipped to deal with it is it is an interesting take when you see any horror movie in which evil wins over good because that's always supposed to be the thing for horror movies is that you know even despite all the horrible things that you go through at the end evil good guys prevail yeah the good guys prevail evil's put, shown their place but then every once in a while you get these films and it, and i think it's uh, especially effective when it's you know the evil child genre where the the yeah. evil kid wins so we should talk I me mean, like we should talk about that a little bit i mean i think there's like you said there's like there's like a genre like a subgenre of horror movies where there's the kind of an evil kid is sort of, or evil children is sort of like the central a plot point i mean the omen like you said is the obvious comparison here and there's also you know children of the corn and i mean i guess village of the Ros- damned village of the damned or rosemary's baby to a kind of certain extent but uh, rose i think that's that is a perfect example actually yeah, and it's at the point where even the child doesn't exist there's just all these machinations put forth to ensure that the child does live and then at right. the end when um, I can't think of her name. Essentially, when Rosemary Mia Farrow. Mia Farrow has the chance to kill the spawn of Satan, she's like, "I'll raise him." Yep, the mother has chosen the evil child, and whether or not it's like a conscious choice, or if it's just sort of, as the father says in this movie, it's just maternal instinct sort of taking over and trumping any other kind of rational thought that the mother might otherwise have. It's it's it makes it really kind of creepy. And I think going back to your original question of you know, movies where evil really wins out. I think the evil kid genre is where it's most effective because like we're, you know, so much of, of society and, and, you know, a parent's life revolves around kind of protecting their children. The fact that that kind of, you know, urged and in, in, in instinct to protect your children kind of trumps your rational thought is like the fact that evil can sort of hide in that nurturing instinct is a really kind of creepy, a creepy thought. I think it works really well in this movie. I, I totally agree. And if it was someone else's creepy child that I was kind of involved in, I would not think twice about kicking someone else's creepy child in the face <laughs> but if it was my child obviously it's the, the confliction of yeah and as you put it it's the parent's job to ensure that your child grows up as right, soon as you exactly. become a parent that is your job yeah your priorities totally change um so yeah no i i totally agree i think i think it was very the film did a very effective job of of showing that kate you know loved that child no matter what and alan was kind of I guess I wouldn't say that he was more realistic, but he realized that she was evil and he wasn't being duped by it. 
yeah, you almost had to have one of the parents sort of come to that conclusion. And I guess I'm glad that they didn't lean too much into the girl, the, the, the Bonnie driving a wedge between the parents. I think it was more emotionally effective. The fact that you could tell the parents were still trying to keep it together throughout the whole movie, but you almost needed a little bit of that conflict where one parent kind of realizes what the hell is going on and forcing the other parent to sort of, you know, confront that conflict in their mind between this obviously evil child and my urge to protect her. I think you kind of needed one of those parents to sort of do what the dad did and sort of try to, like, you got to choose something, you know, our, one of our, one of our children, our children have been dying and we're going to lose the last one. We've got to choose. Yeah. So what would I mean, you give the film overall? I, I, I really like this one. And I, I was again surprised how much I liked it. I think I mean this is probably a four out of five for me, four and a half even. Wow. I you know yeah. what? I, I gave it a three and a half. I gave it a three and a half because again, dream sequence. I okay, yeah, I, I like really that. wish that that was the ending. Yeah, that's fair. I, that's understandable. Um and I I kind of wish I got to see a little bit of more of Alan and Kate not making out but kind of talking about the situation that they're in because of the very be- the, the first half until they moved to london kate and alan are kind of non-emotional about a lot of the stuff that they're going through yeah yeah exactly i think that's like that's that's kind of what makes it not a five for me is the fact that the parents motivations well like you you definitely sympathize with them and they were you know they acted really well there are definitely enough times where you're questioning like real like really your real world brain starts to kind of kick in and figure like wait why would you not take this little girl to the doctor why would you not alert the authorities this like something as weird is going on and i think you hit the nail on the head i think it that would have been improved if we saw a couple maybe even just one scene of the the mom and the dad sort of talking through things and at least like at least show us how they're coming to the conclusion to not involve child services or not take her to the doctor to like give like throw the audience a bone so that they buy into the fact that they're not you know not reacting the way that you think that they would in real life give me that medical horror moment like from the exorcist where they're submitting bonnie to all these tests oh god and and she's mri yeah yeah, and she's still beating them somehow right like show me that stuff and then i'll agree that kate would be duped by there's nothing wrong with my child Mm -hmm. we've done all these tests we've proven medically that there's nothing wrong with bonnie yeah Um, that would have been that's that's a really good example that from the exorcist like show us the fact that the daughter can get past the tests basically like show, show us the fact that you know, medical science and the, the quote, the authorities are powerless to, to, to help them. I think that would have really helped. I, it was still a really good film. I highly recommend it to anyone who wants to, I think this is the perfect example of mom horror. There is not, there's nothing really graphic in the entire film and the subject matter would probably be horrific for any mom. This is like the, this oh, is like parent, a 10 yeah. out of 10 for mom horror. This yeah, is the, mom, mom horror, not in like the mocking phrase, like yeah. literally horror that would get to parents. Yes, this would is definitely effective to I uh, uh, to any parent to watch, and I, I honestly am kind of shocked by how high quality the film is. There was multiple times watching the movie where I'm like, wow, this 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 is like a movie movie. This oh, is yeah. they're playing it super straight. They're playing it, you know, the I, movie not campy at all. Beyond the Lucy doll at the end where she's <laughs> everything looked really good throughout the entire thing. Mm-hmm. So I was, kinda, I was surprisingly impressed. Yeah, it was definitely the production quality was really up there. And actually the, you didn't remind me of something I wanted to bring up, which is the fact that it, this movie, it, it's, it's all, it's very sunny, especially in the beginning. And there's that idea like country landscape and it reminded me of midsummer. Yes from a couple of years ago or maybe like a year or two ago at most, but I mean, the kind of like this kind of, it almost had that folk horror look to it where things were very sunny and nature features very prominently in a lot of the imagery and this whole idea of this kind of creepy pregnant woman kind of coming out of nowhere, dropping a baby onto an unsuspecting family and then disappearing again has a very kind of folk tale feel about it. And the fact that a lot of the horror takes place during the daytime, like you said, not mm-hmm. a lot of horror films do that. They don't take, 
I, I think because people feel safe during the daylight that nothing really horrific That's happens in a movie. Um, yeah. So I think it's doubly effective when a horror movie does cross that boundary and go like, you're not safe at night or during the day. Nope. I don't think we get, I mean, do we get any scenes at night? I mean, maybe like a couple when, when uh, like the, the part where they're in bed together and, and uh, Bonnie kind of comes in and wants to sleep with them. Yeah. I, that's maybe it. But the right. uh, I think all the the horrific or all the deaths happen during the daytime. Yeah, like during the like bright sunny afternoons. Beautiful sunny England days. Yep. What did you uh, What did you think about the music in this one? Uh, I thought it was good. I think it definitely was one of the first films where the music definitely complemented the scene that was going right. on. It wasn't an upbeat tune in a very depressing scene. They, they actually were able to match, you know, the music to what they were trying to c- convey. Definitely. Yeah. Kind of like, I think, yeah, I, I feel the same way. I mean, if it may be a little bit generic, nothing super memorable, but it, like you said, it fit really well. I mean, it, it, it built up it, you know, it's, it, uh, what's the word? It, it supplemented the tension in a lot of scenes. Um, it was kind of, it set, it set the tone like it should have. So I think yes. they, they did a good job there building the atmosphere and, and kind of, you know, like I said, supplementing it where you needed to. Yep. I, I was, yeah, I was very shocked by how high quality this movie is compared to a lot of the other Canon films that I've seen in the past. So, and, and this was a, a first watch for me as well. I have oh, never, yeah. I've never even heard of this movie. Before uh, yeah, this. And I mean, you know, I, we both gave it you know, pretty good scores, I think. And, and, I just was left wondering at the end of this, I'm, I'm surprised that it it's not more well known. I mean, it was really well done. And I think maybe it must've just gotten kind of submerged or, or, you know, it got forgotten in the wake of all these other evil kid movies, which are much more well known. Like you said, the omen, I mean, yeah, maybe it just, it just didn't kind of take, and it was maybe seen as sort of a, like a ripoff of his other movies and not given, you know, not taken seriously and forgotten about, which is unfortunate because it's really good. It did come a f- four years after the omen. So it was probably one of those response films. Like we made this movie in response to the omen. Um, right. But yeah, I do agree in, in a lot of the, the f- old horror films. I'm surprised that this one doesn't get a lot more love. And there's not really too much information about the movie uh, online. Yeah, it it does really. seem like a lot of people just don't talk about it. Yeah, I think uh, like you said, the, not a lot online. I mean, if, if, if the size of your Wikipedia page is any indication, this one is not well known at all. Because I think, I think you get a plot summary on the Wikipedia page for this in, that, in like a cast list. And I think that's it. Yeah, it looks like the surprising. the average rating on Letterboxd is surprisingly low, two point six. Really, uh, a two shame. and a half uh, rating has twenty six percent of the votes. So yeah, I, I again, I think the only thing I can think of is is that people just maybe compare it unfairly to other evil kid movies like The Omen or Rosemary's Baby or Children of the Corn or any of those, and just. You know, like I said, unfairly comparing because I think this one is, I think this one is unique enough where it, it kind of holds its own. It tries to just do something different. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like a ripoff, even if it did only get made because the Omen was successful. I think it, I think it does its own thing and does it well. True. Very true. And I think this one is definitely going to be the, the better one uh, when we compare it to the next film that we're going to watch. Oh boy which is actually a sequel. So we're going to watch a sequel before um, we see the original because I don't think the original was available uh, for us to watch. And this one is on Amazon Prime. Are you ready to watch The Happy Hooker Goes to Hollywood? (laughs) If you want, I will let you veto this if you want. Uh, Let's say once a month we get to veto one film just solely off the fact of the title right (laughs) Um, i think this is another one you've you've talked about in maybe our first episode where we're kind of going over the canon history i i I don't think i can veto this in good conscience because the title is just so bonkers that i i need to see i need to see the movie behind it all right 
So let's go ahead and let's get the plot synopsis. The happy hooker goes to Hollywood is the, is <laughs> actually, it's the last of a trilogy. What? That's insane <laughs> oh that there is more than just the one. Um, happy hooker extended cinematic universe. That's insane. It's loosely based off the life of Ig- Xavier Hollander, a prostitute from the Netherlands, as she attempts to make a film in Hollywood based on her best-selling book about her life. So mm-hmm. I'm assuming her she's a prostitute. Has an erotic memoir. A movie about her life. It's going to be a <laughs> lot of sex scenes, maybe some lame comedy. Um, it is 88 minutes. Trim. So... It'll be interesting for sure. Um, It'll be definitely a, a definitely a jump from this one. I think I'm glad we <laughs> I'm glad we're not watching uh, Gas Pump Girls and then Happy Hooker goes to Hollywood two in a row. That right? would be too that would be too much of that kind of movie exactly for me in, in, in the stretch. So I'm glad we broke it up with a really quality horror movie in the middle. Yep, you didn't know what the I think that what I enjoy, especially uh, talking about it here with you. I think I'm reassessing the the rating that it gave the godsend and that is actually is a better film than my initial reaction oh, okay. so um this actually might be a film that i rewatch sooner rather than later and reassess and knowing I, everything that i've seen from the movie i can just sit back relax and enjoy it and know where yeah. the film is going and not get frustrated by characters and just watch it just like not being, I don't know. It wasn't that I was anxious. You're, you're not in. You're on. You're not in analysis mode. You're not in exactly poking holes in the plot mode like we might otherwise be. I'm kind of just sitting there enjoying the movie for it to be a movie. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely recommend. I mean, for people listening, I mean, definitely. Even though if you've listened to this whole episode and you've kind of had the plot spoiled for you, it's definitely still worth a watch. Yes, and, and maybe in the future, if we have a high quality film, we'll try to not give away the ending um maybe we'll we'll do like a thing where we stop talking about the film and we'll talk about the next episode and then if you're interested in hearing the end conversation for the movie we'll play it like after the credits right that's where the spoilers code blah blah exactly if you're interested in hearing what happened at the end of the godsend please jump to one hour and 30 minutes um but yes highly recommend it highly recommend definitely so what's the uh what's the quote what's the, the quote of the week this one so in general I, it was hard to come up with for the quote of the week in this one not because the lines were bad but because i was so engrossed in the movie that i, I was just not doing a great job listening for interesting lines that's good though i think that, that a, definitely shows how quality of the movie you oh found it's very it. good I, I did I did have one though and, and and this was after I'd actually started like trying to listen out for it because I knew I would want to have one. Um, but the quote of the week this week actually comes from the dream sequence and and you actually you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier where there's the part where um, he's leading Bonnie down to the water and has kind of like left her on a rock and the tide's coming in. He starts to climb up and leave her there and he kind of turns down and looks at her and says, you know, you know I know, don't you, Bonnie? Nice. And says, what? You know what? And he says, I know you. Awesome. I just, that, that was so, and it, it wasn't delivered. It, it could have been delivered maybe a little bit better, but on paper, that is such a creepy way to show that the dad, like the jig is up. Like he, he knows. He doesn't say, I know you killed the kids. I know you could bubble, but he doesn't go into this like, long expository, you know, uh, rant about, I know you did this. I know you did that. I know you're evil. I'm going to stop you. It doesn't do that. He just says, I know you. That, that, is, that is a damn good quote. And that's, yeah. again, that's, oh man, I wish that was the ending. Because he, <laughs> I, I love. didn't help that, did I? <laughs> I love the fact that he was, he was just pointing at that child and go like, I know, I know you yeah. know, and I know you know, I know, I know. <laughs> like, that's the thing. Like, it, it could almost have been a, a joke line in a different movie, but just the way, like the, the way that the movie had kind of unfolded up to this point, And it was just really effective way to, to show, show the audience that the dad, like he, he understood what was going on and he had like finally put all the pieces together and he was accepting it. And Bonnie just kind of 
she gave him that stare. He's like, what do you know? <laughs> you don't know shit. You don't know old shit. Old man, I'm going to give you the mumps. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kiss you and give you the mumps, and it's going to be weird for people to watch. Super weird. <laughs> but that's the godsend. Love it. Well, if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. I have absolutely no idea how you leave a review for a podcast, but this is just something people say at the end of a show. <laughs> so do it. If you'd like, I do encourage everyone to give us some constructive criticism on how we can make this podcast more enjoyable to you. You can follow us on Twitter at That's Canon, and you can also email us at That's Canon at gmail.com. That's two N's, C-A-N-N-O-N. And remember, since we said it, That's Canon. I fucking said it without messing it up. Xavier Hollander's new movie, Happy Hooker Goes Hollywood. Can you make it in Hollywood? I want this book to be a blockbuster movie. You hear me? Give me the rights to this book. You get me this girl. Get me Xaviera!